We will now have a look at Tut's drawing algorithm. This is one of the most fundamental work at all in all of graph drawing. This is based on a paper by William T. Tutt. And this was written in 1962. It was published in 1963 and it has the nice title How to Draw a Graph. And this is one of the most important papers at all in graph drawing. So saying that this is a variant of the Springer-Better algorithm by Eats is a lie. The eats springer better algorithm came 21 years later. But we can formulate this as a variant. And that's why it fits into this lecture. But before we do that, let's figure out what is the idea behind this algorithm. Let's have a look at some triangle. Let's say we've already drawn this. We have these three vertices, they have this position, we don't want to change it anymore. And now we want to add a new vertex that's connected to all three of them. Where would you place this vertex? Well, since we want straight line drawings, V has to be somewhere in the middle. But even here we have a lot of choices. Do we like this one? Or this one? Or this one? I'm pretty sure that all of you would choose this position here. But why do we like it? What is the reason behind this position? Well, it's kind of in the middle of this face. And what vertex is in the middle of some polygon? That's the barycenter. How can we compute the barycenter of a bunch of vertices, do you remember? We just take their positional vectors, we sum them up and divide it by the number of vertices. So to get the x-coordinate of v, we sum up the x-coordinates of these vertices divided by 3 or by k in general. And the same for the y-coordinate. And now the idea behind Tut's algorithm is very simple. You just take all your vertices and place them repeatedly at the very center of the neighbors. Until at some point you hopefully converge to a drawing where in fact every vertex lies in the very center of its neighbors. Like I said, we can model this as a force-directed algorithm. So we want to figure out what kind of forces do we have to apply to the vertices so that we can get this. In this algorithm we don't want to cool down at all, so this is always a 1. And the goal is that after this every vertex lies at the very center of its neighbors. So let's try to calculate what should be the new position of our vertex u. It's the very center of these, so it's their positions divided by k. So for every edge u, v and e, we take the position of v and divide it by the degree of u. If it has k neighbors, its degree is k, we have to divide this whole thing by k. So the resulting force that we want is we want to get it to this position. That means we have to add this vector and we have to remove the vector of its current position. If I want to move from 1 to 2, then I can go 2 to the right and 1 to the left. And the same with general vectors. If I want to move from position u to position v, I can take the vector 0 v and subtract the vector 0 u, and then I'm there. So this is the resulting force that we want to get. We first want to reformulate this a little bit. We can actually pull this inside here and write pv minus pu. Why can we do that? We divide by the degree of u, and we have degree of u sums here. So if I take pu divided by degree of u, then I can push it into all of these brackets and we still get the same. And this here is basically the Euclidean distance between these two points. So this is the result that we want. Now, how can we model this with these two forces? Do you have an idea? Well, if we'll have a look, we have some force to the neighbors, but we don't have force to the non-neighbors. So we don't need a repulsive force. We can just set re repulsive force always to zero. And the attractive force will be just that. So we have 1 divided by the degree times the Euclidean distance. 
And that's all the forces we need. So let's have a look again at a demo. Let's take the first graph again. And now we use the TAT algorithm. We have these forces and let's see what happens. Hmm. This is a problem. What, what happened here? Why do we get such a weird layout? What is going on? Let's have a look. We take a vertex and we put it at the very center of its neighbors. And we want to continue until there is no force left or the force get too small. How can we get a... So, ah, if I put every vertex at the same position, then this here is always a zero. And then this force is a zero, this is a zero for every pair of vertices, so we have an equilibrium. So just putting every vertex at the origin gives us already a solution. That's of course not something that we want. How can we solve this? If we look at our example here again, here we said that this triangle is already fixed and we only want to put the vertex V inside it somewhere. So the solution for us is that we don't want to find the position of all the vertices, but we fix the coordinates of the outer face. So we pick some face of a planar embedding of the graph, we find good positions for it as the outer face, let's say some convex polygon, and then we compute the coordinates of all the other vertices. Let's go back to the example. Now I picked a few vertices here, the red ones, and I fixed them. And now we get a very nice layout. This is much better. And actually, when we drew this graph earlier with the other two algorithms, would you have guessed that this is a planar graph? I mean, with some experience, you can kind of see that this looks like a polytope, and polytopes uh, can be drawn planar. But just looking at this planar embedding, we have so many crossings. And in this, we get, just get no crossings at all. So for this specific graph, this is so much nicer. Now what about this other graph here, the planar one, where Eats and Fruchtermann and Rheingold both did not get a planar drawing. The goal is that Tut draws it planar, but again it fails. Damn. What happened here? Hmm. Can you see something? Well, as said before, we want to fix the outer face. What have we fixed here? We fixed these four red vertices, but they don't form the outer face. If we put them on the outside, then there's no way to have this path and this path not cross each other. So it's really important that what I choose at the outer face really is a face on the graph. So let's just pick a slightly different vertex. Instead of this one, I pick that one. Now. This is a cycle on the graph, and if I run the algorithm, then actually I again get a planar drawing, because this is a face of a planar embedding. However, you can already see some disadvantage of this. Here, we cannot see much at all anymore. The resolution gets pretty bad. We have this large face, but Basically, you, the further you go inside, the smaller the faces go, and the closer the vertices go together. And now since I drew them as quite large disks, I cannot even see anymore where the edges are here. So it gives us a planar drawing, but still maybe not the best. In this case, maybe the Eats drawing or the fruchtermann rheingold drawing was better, although there are crossings in it. But that's not all. We have formulated this whole thing with forces. And in the other two algorithms, we always had to cool down the forces so we get to some equilibrium. Here, we chose not to cool down. And actually, we can show that we can get an equilibrium here and that there is a unique solution. And that is because 
we can formulate these forces by a linear system of equations. So let's recall, the goal for us is that every vertex lies in the very center of its neighbors, so it has this coordinate. Let's say that the position of u has the x-coordinate xu, y-coordinate yu, then we can just say, okay, we get the x-coordinates this way and the y-coordinates this way. Let's assume we have variables for all the vertices. So we have a variable for the x-coordinate of u, for the y-coordinate of u, the same for all the other v's. Now I want to slightly change it. I will multiply with a degree and I will move everything to one side. Then I will have something that looks like this. And if you remember linear algebra, this might look familiar to you. This here are two systems of linear equations. We have a bunch of variables and we have a sum of those variables times some constants and equals zero on the right. So we can write each of those as a matrix A times the x coordinates equals B. And the same thing for the y coordinates. And B in this example here is always just a zero. So let's try it out on one example. We have this small graph here, we have u1, u2, u3 on the outside, and we want to write down this system of linear equations. But I immediately want to write it down with this matrix. So we want to build this matrix A for the linear equation system Ax equals b. And we want to do it in such a way, there's a reason that I chose these labels, we just number the vertices from 1 to n, and in the kth row we have vertex k, in the kth column we have vertex k. So how does this look like now? Let's have a look at the first vertex u1. We have here degree of the vertex times the x-coordinate of it. So we put a 3 here. And then for every neighbor we have minus the x-coordinate of the neighbor. u2 is a neighbor, so we have minus 1 times x2. u3 is a neighbor, so we have minus 1 times x3. u4 is not a neighbor, so we put a 0 here. u5 is a neighbor, so we have a minus 1. u6 is not a neighbor, so we have a 0. And the same we can do for all the others. If we look at u2, it has three neighbors, so we put a 3 here, and for the edges to 1, 3, and 4, we put a minus 1, for the rest a 0. For u3, we have degree 3, and we put the neighbors. Degree 3 is here, the degree 2 goes here, the degree 2 goes here, and then we get this matrix. So in general, the entries of this matrix is on the diagonals, we have the degrees, and on the non-diagonals, we have a minus 1, if and only if there is an edge between the two vertices. And this is the so-called Laplacian matrix of G. There's a lot of theory about this matrix. This is quite important. There's so much stuff you can do with it. You can cover whole lectures with that. But if you want to have some impression, just go to Wikipedia and have a look at the Laplacian matrix. But for now we only want to figure out if this system of linear equations has a unique solution. So how many variables do we have and how many constraints do we have? We have one variable for every vertex, so n variables. And we have one constraint, one row for every vertex, so also n constraints. For a square matrix, we know that a system of linear equations has a unique solution if the determinant is non-zero. What is the determinant of this matrix here? Unfortunately, it is zero. And that's a property of the Laplacian matrix in general. But this is not so surprising. Here, we have all the vertices as free vertices. For every vertex, we have a variable. So for every vertex, we want to find a position. And we earlier found out, you get a solution if you just put all the vertices on the same position. So there's an infinite number of solutions because you can take any coordinate and put the vertex there, and then you're good. So it's clear that there is not a unique solution. 
So what we haven't accounted for are those fixed vertices. So the x coordinate of u1, of u2 and u3 is a constant. That means we can just delete these columns. We can just calculate what does this constant uh, refer to and push it into the b. Also, if we look at these rows, we have defined an attractive force only for free vertices. These vertices are fixed. There is no attractive force in them. So we don't have these rows. Let's get rid of them again. So if we have k free vertices, now we have a matrix left with k constraints and k variables. This looks very similar to what we had before, but there's a very big difference. If we look at the large matrix, in every row, the sum is zero. In every column, the sum is zero. If we look at this now here, here this row sums up to a one. This column sums up to a one. This is a one, this is a one, this is a one, this is a one. Now we don't have any more that all the rows sum up to zero and all the columns sum up to zero. And this is so-called diagonally dominant matrix. That means that the numbers on the diagonal are at least as large as the sum of the absolute numbers in the rest of the row, for all of those, and it's larger for some of them. And for those matrices, we know that the determinant is larger than zero. Because just taking the product of this diagonal is already larger than everything that you are able to subtract afterwards. So we have a square matrix, determinant greater than zero, that means we have a unique solution. So instead of going through these forces and iteratively finding the new forces for every vertex, calculating the coordinates until we get to an equilibrium, we can just set up the system of linear equations and compute a solution. And that we can do in polynomial time. And the resulting drawing that we get is unique based on the coordinates of the outer face. And this drawing we call the touch drawing. And in the next two parts we want to prove some very important properties of these touch drawings.